You'll need to close the graphic, Yolanda. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this August 13th extraordinary meeting of the Charlotte City Council Transportation Planning and Development Committee. As usual, we will start with introductions, perhaps going around the table. Ed McKinney with the uh, City Manager's Office. Sarah Hazel, Chief Sustainability and Resiliency Officer. Matt Hassett, City Treasurer in the Finance Office. Dante Anderson, Mayor Pro Tem, District 1. Vi Lyles, Mayor. Malcolm Graham, Committee Member. Marjorie Molina, Vice Chair. Ed Driggs, Chair. Renee Johnson, District 4, Committee Member. Marcus Jones, City Manager. Liz Babson, Assistant City Manager. Yolanda Jones, Planning Staff. Brad Thomas, City Attorney's Office. Brent Cagle, Interim CEO, CATS. And in the room. Patrick Baker, City Attorney. Good evening, Alexander, Charlotte Transportation. Back, far corner. Charlotte Transportation, City of Charlotte, Mayor And finally, online. Rusty Knox, Mayor Davidson, Vice Chair of MTC. Luana Mayfields, Charlotte City Council Member at Large. Lee Altman, Mecklen uh, Mecklenburg County Commissioner at Large and Chair of the Metropolitan Transit Commission. Victoria Watland. Charlotte City Council of Large Committee Member. I think that's everybody. Great. Um, special welcome, Commissioner Altman and Mayor Knox. Appreciate your being here today, uh, demonstrating the collaboration between Charlotte and the MTC. So uh, this is a milestone moment uh, for Charlotte, for Mecklenburg, and for the realization of a truly regional mobility plan. After years of work, we are now at the point of being able to take some real action towards the realization of the plan. The plan has profound implications, not only for mobility, but also economic development, housing, the environment, equity, and more. Uh, it's a very significant step that we're, we're contemplating taking today. Specifically, we're considering passing a resolution in support of a draft state legislation that would allow Mecklenburg County to conduct a referendum on a one cent sales tax for transportation to be placed on the ballot next year. The draft legislation also provides for the creation of an authority to oversee rail and bus operations within its service area. Uh, it is clear that any step as large as this probably is going to involve some diversity of opinion among the interested parties. So, and, and the plan is certainly not perfect, but I want to emphasize uh, Charlotte got to this point as a result of, uh, frankly, the dogged determination of our mayor and manager to take action on this aspiration that we've had for so long and not let the current initiative fail because of a lack of consensus. So uh, we had to deal with issues in order to get here. Uh, and I'll mention a couple of them. The northern towns required that plans for the red line would not fail again, as they have since 1998. So Charlotte is buying the red line property to ensure that we'll be able to proceed with the red line. Uh, the legislature made clear in the past year or so that they would not support a resolution that contemplated 80 or 90 percent of the proceeds of the sale tax being spent on rail. So 
the draft legislation proposes a 40-20-40 split between rail, transit, bus, and roads. The MTC members did require that the legislation provide for the creation of an authority. They also made clear that an authority over which Charlotte had complete control by virtue of its population would not be acceptable, and I think it's understandable. Uh, creation of the authority is, in fact, also in Charlotte's interest. So, the draft legislation includes language creating an authority and giving Charlotte 44% of the board appointments, which is a minority position but twice the number of any other member. And finally, uh, because the large majority of the rail and bus spend is likely to be needed in Charlotte, the six Mecklenburg towns will receive 125% of their pro rata share of the road money. <laughs> We're about to hear a detailed staff presentation about the proposed legislation. There are two points that I would like to make before we hear that. For one, if we did decide not to proceed with this draft legislation in favor of a different process, I believe it will take us years uh, to get back to this point, if ever. I think we have an opportunity now that may not come again that soon. Uh, and furthermore, I think that all that will happen if we did do that we will walk down the same road and end up in the same place. It was not an accident that we got to where we are today. It was the result of a lot of input from various parties without the cooperation of which nothing happens. The second point I want to make is, at the end of the day, the public is going to decide through the referendum whether or not this moves ahead. Um, we will need to engage in an extensive program of outreach, but at the end of the day, uh, we have to get to a point where the public is prepared to accept it. So concerns today about whether what we're talking about is in the public interest are, are really not that important. We're going to have to figure that out over the next 15 months. And uh, so with that said, we're now going to hear in more detail about this uh, legislation uh, and after which there will be a com an opportunity for committee and others to discuss. And with that, I think I will hand off to Ms. Babson. Or Mr. Jones, okay, thank you. take it. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll be brief before I turn it over to Ed McKinney, but I think it's important to recognize a, a number of folks who've been working on this project. It's very interesting. There's some uh, people who have been uh, in the city working on this project from the first day in the city, and we're going back to the to the mid '90s. Um, so just, and I'm not saying, Brad, that you've been here that long, but I do want to recognize uh, some of the folks from Mr. Baker's legal team that have played a part of this, Brad Thomas, Stuart Pratt, Lisa Flowers, from CATS, uh, Brent Cagle, Kelly Goforth, and Brian Nadolny. From Finance, uh, our CFO, Teresa Smith, uh, Matt Hest Hestet, and we also have uh, Jeremy Carter from DCA here today, thank you. From my office, Liz Babson, Ed McKinney, uh, Dana Fenton, and also uh, Jason Snyder, and the, the glue that keeps us all together is uh, Sarah Hazel. So I want to thank uh, the team for that, but more importantly, I want to thank the mayor. I want to thank um, the council and the council work group for giving us guidance all along. Um, so let, let's go, let's get to it. Okay, so um, I'll tee it up a bit. Uh, this work has been a long time coming, as the chair has said and not a single part of this has been easy. We've been working on uh, many pieces simultaneously, and now there's an opportunity for all of those to come together. And, and I say all that uh, because it's important. There's a lot of things that this council has been doing since 2020, um, whether it's CAP, whether it's the 2040 plan, whether we're dealing with strategic mobility plan. While the funding wasn't available and still isn't today, you didn't stop working on plans, which is extremely important. So I, I thank the council, the mayor and the council, for keeping your eye on the bigger opportunity, which is achieving a generational opportunity to fund mobility and the needs for a growing city. Okay, there are two critical components that we'll talk with you today about. One is acquiring the red line, and as the chairman uh, spoke about, the uh, legislation authorizing a one cent sales tax. What I will tell you that as this team has worked over the course of the last uh, few years, 
uh, we always had these principles in mind. One, protect the city and the city council's interests. And that includes the risk and the liabilities associated with operating a transit system. Uh, also, it's been to safeguard our employees. As we start to think about if this can become a reality, um, our employees would be a part of the new authority. So we want to ensure clarity, uh, employment for our, our teammates, and protection with their retirement system. And uh, I think what's also important is keep in mind that as we start to think about these principles, we also kept in mind the transit riders, which 90% of them live in Charlotte. So those are the principles that you're here over and over again, and I hope you see this through the presentation. Okay. With every council uh, priority setting session, you've talked a lot about, uh, uh, we call it three prongs or a three-legged stool, which is a, a place to live, a good paying job, and a way to get there. And that's the mobility piece. And we can advance the slide. And um, we think that, again, that that's a part of, of where we are today. I, I think that um, you positioned this in a way, I think, never before as a city in terms of thinking about this, taking time to, to have the strategic mobility plan, taking time to have all of these additional groups, whether it's the Nest Commission or what we're doing with e equitable economic development, just everything is starting to come together. It's just the funding piece, which has been our, our problem. I will tell you this, um, one of the things, is how do we get here? Starting back in 2021, after Charlotte moves in this very room, we talked about um, you directing me to do three things, develop a funding strategy, a financing strategy, and a legislative strategy so we could move this sales tax forward. Uh, June 2022, you adopted the strategic mobility plan. Last year, you focused on the blueprint for mobility. And we talk about that from time to time. I don't mean a year, but over 2,000 projects from sidewalks to road networks that um, we have, plans that other peer cities don't have. The peer cities, as I mentioned earlier, they have the funding but not the plans. Uh, we're the inverse. We have the plans but not the funding. I actually talked to Councilmember Graham to get clearance for what I'm about to say. I remember in this very room he said it was like Fantasy Island. You know, we have, we have all of these goals and visions, but there's no money. So I think that's, that's what's very important about what we're trying to do today. What you did do in this last budget, you reaffirmed your commitment to mobility as a priority. You did it through the, the uh, annual strategy meeting, but also through your recently approved uh, CIP. So now onto the red line and, and on to uh, CATS. We've done the work. Brent's leadership has been incredible because CATS is now stabilized. We kept working with Norfolk Southern, and we had a breakthrough last summer where they were willing to come to the table to give us this uh, opportunity that for over a decade has not been uh, possible. At the same time, uh, we worked through the interlocal agreement with the county and the six towns. And, and now, as was mentioned earlier, each of the jurisdictions will have before them an opportunity to look at the legislation and potentially pass a resolution um, supporting it. If that occurs throughout um, Mecklenburg County, and only after that occurs, would the leg proposed legislation advance to the General Assembly? And then the General Assembly would decide whether or not, hopefully in the short session, to uh, give the residents of Mecklenburg County the opportunity to go to the polls uh, as early as next year to see whether or not they'd like to tax themselves in order to have this one cent sales tax and also have some of these investment opportunities that we talked about um, earlier. So as you can see, uh, it's been a lot going on, um, but we have a pretty big team here today that's trying to bring everybody up to a level understanding of where we are and what the next steps will be. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Ed McKinney. Thank you. As, again, Ed McKinney with the city manager's office. You go to the next, or maybe just briefly, if the manager hadn't touched on this, just a quick uh, touch on the schedule. Obviously, we're here today at the, at the uh, committee meeting. We've got the closed session coming up next week to dis discuss more detail the red line. 
we'll have all of this discussion at an action review, and then ultimately we're teeing up um, discussion of potential action with council on September 3rd. So let's jump into the next slide. So we've got two topics to cover, red line and the draft legislation. We'll start with the red line. What I'll do is provide just some context that we're really teed up for, for Brad Thomas and, and Matt to talk more detail about the negotiations, the status of the conversation on the purchase from Norfolk Southern. If you go to the next slide, um, we know a lot of this, but just it's a couple of points to really remind ourselves about the context of the red line within our transit plan uh, historically and where we are today. So it has always been a fun fundamental part of the transit plan dating back to 98, the first half cent sales tax. A point to be made, and it has been made, that that initial sales tax was intended to be funded, but the funding of the red line was a part of that initial sales tax. I'll talk a little bit about and we, we know some of that story as to why not, but it's, it's an important point to make. And then certainly because of all that in context, it has been consistently the position of the Northern Towns that that is a fundamental part of this plan and, and their support moving forward is, is contingent on our commitment to the red line as a, as a project. If you go to the next slide, uh, another, another part of that context Thinking about historically, we've, uh, we want to sort of think about the evolution of our transit plan over time. If you go back to 98, certainly the red line was part of that, and it's been a part of it all the way through. This diagram sort of represents the sort of evolution of the plan represented by the, the length of corridors uh, represented over time. So that's, it's changed. Uh, the evolution of mode. Uh, the evolution of each of the corridors has changed as the MTC has updated their plan over time. It's clear, though, uh, and again, the point to be made from the northern towns, that the red line has always been a part of that plan, and it's always been on the O-line corridor and has always been uh, commuter rail. Other parts of the plan have changed. Other modes have changed on other corridors, but the consistent um, point here is the red line has always been part of that plan. If you go to the next slide... Just to talk about um, what the situation is today and where we face and kind of what the, the, the unique opportunity we have now with the conversations with Norfolk Southern. Access to the, to the corridor, the O-line, has always been the obstacle. Uh, and we know historically for the last 20 years, Norfolk Southern has been unable really to provide us access to that corridor. In 2013, they actually passed a national policy that said uh, they were not going to share passenger service on any of their corridors nationally. So that, that was a really clear statement in 2013. In that same time period, uh, back to the point of the 98 sales tax and the funding of the red line, given that obstacle, an MTC decision was to say, okay, with the funding available, let's move to the next priority corridor. That became the blue line extension. So again, a point there is yes, it had, the red line had always been intended to be funded by the first half cent, we face a significant obstacle in that that decision then got made to, to use that, that funding for the Blue Line extension. What has changed, and again, Brad and, and Matt will talk a little bit about this in more detail, but since 2021, we've been in conversations with Norfolk Southern. Their openness to talk with us about gaining access or, or purchase of the corridor, that those conversations intensified in, in, in just the last year, so we've been in some very detailed uh, negotiations. Brad will walk through that in more detail. We're obviously, as we all know, we're hopeful uh, that that will come to a conclusion here in the next several weeks. The point here, and again, take the big picture and step back, we've been under a 20-year, more than 20 years, of trying to get access to the O-line. It's been a commitment of the plan of the MTC of the city, for sure, to have access. And we, this is a great, this is an uh, unprecedented opportunity at this point given the conversations where we are with Norfolk Southern and our commitment to the plan. A couple more things on the context for us. Go to the next slide. It's important to remind ourselves about the, the, the value of this corridor, not just of the overall plan, but for the city of Charlotte. So this, this sort of zooms in on that corridor and just, just sort of focuses in on the city of Charlotte portion. Almost half of the corridor, 11 miles, there's four transit stations in there. We've been doing plans around those transit stations uh, since the beginning of the, of the planning for the corridor. So we've anticipated and, and have our own um, future vision for development around those stations. It connects to Uptown, right? It's an important part of the regional connection to our major employment destination. Um, 
you know, the, the sort of the heart of the region and the, and the uh, sort of sports, entertainment, et cetera, as a, as a core a part of our region. But more, even more significantly, this connection to Gateway Station over the long term. Gateway Station is a fundamental part of our system, the long-term transit system, but it's, it's not just about the county or the region. It's actually, you know, beyond the region to the state, the connection across our rail program statewide and certainly long-term, the connection of our rail program along the East Coast. So it's, we need to remind ourselves the importance of Gateway Station and the red lines being a, a key part of that. So again, a, a, the point there is just to be made that it is important to us, the city, and it's an important part of our plan. Last thing I'll say before I throw it to Brad, <clears throat> and this, this begins to touch converse, uh, some discussions that Sarah and I will have after this topic around the draft legislation, but we wanted to put it here uh, because it sort of relates to the red line, but there are some uh, key provisions in the draft legislation that relate to red line, so we just wanna make that clear. First, the sort of project definition. There are some key things that we that were um, included in the draft legislation around essentially the length of the corridor. So it's important to Davidson that if it terminates in their jurisdiction, that they have to be the ones that make that determination. So that's part of the draft of the legislation. And then, as I think we've all known, we've been talking about the potential, and Brad will mention this, of, of extension of the, of the corridor purchase as an option in Tyredale County. Same thing, the decisions uh, of that extension will rest very clearly with their approval uh, to do that. On the reimbursement, it's important in the draft legislation for everyone to know that this potential purchase that you will make is codified in the draft legislation that reimbursement will be part of uh, this plan, the legislation, the potential of a new authority. So it's very clear in the, in the legislation that reimbursement of our investment will be made by this future authority in, um, in, in a several different ways, and Brad can talk about that. Last things I'll say, prioritization and design. Again, another important part of the commitment that we made in the draft legislation was to ensure that it will be the first project. And so the commitment there is that it will be underway and, and have to be halfway complete before we complete any other rail project. So, Projects can happen concurrently, but it's clear in the legislation that red line has to be first and we have to be significantly on our way to completion before we complete any other project. And then as, as was always anticipated, but it's clear in the legislation that design decisions, review, et cetera, will be, will be uh, had and input will be, will be gained directly from the northern towns that are, that are most directly affected by the design of the corridor. So, I'll stop there. That just gives you some context, a little bit of conversation that we'll jump into and more on the draft um, legislation, specifically around the red line. I'll throw it over to Brad to sort of give an update on where we are in the negotiations. Thank you, Ed. I think oh, actually sorry, we're going to go to, to me yeah, first. Apologize, so. Matt. No, no worries. So one thing I will say that I believe, it, and Brad can sort of go into this a little bit as well, is that I think some of the, the terms are going to come to city council as part of the closed sessions because we are still in active negotiations. So this is a little bit more sort of big picture instead of how we're able to do some of the, the financing. Um, but this is two properties and two transactions, but it's really one overall sort of plan of finance, I would say. Um, so. Chairman, as you said, the city, the MTC, the region, the legislature has really been interested in the idea of an authority. But the timeline that Norfolk Southern has put on us for a September transaction does not allow for an authority to be stood up, the revenue to come in and, and actually sort of be in place. So the city is looking to step in on an interim basis to acquire the O-line and an uptown property at the Gateway Station to allow this that to happen. So what we're looking to do is um, sort of make the, the purchase up front. And the way we'd be doing this is looking to do a short-term note um, or variable rate financing for, for basically five years. So this would allow for the legislation to be passed, an authority to be established, and the revenue to start, and allow for an authority to then come and reimburse the city. And the way we're able to, to maintain this, as well as the steady state affordability that has been adopted by the city council is in the FY 2025 budget with the the out years of the CIP, the 26 and 28 referendum cycles, had identified funding for transit-oriented projects. So what we're able to do is advance that from the 26 and 28 referendums to now. And one of the reasons we're able to do that is we're converting that from what would have been principal and interest payments coming online to the city 
to interest only payments for that five year period and allow for the, then the authority to come reimburse the city. And because of that five year window and that reimbursement timeline, that affordability would come back to the city long term. So we're really only looking at sort of that five year window. Um, so that's a really critical part of the legislation that we're, we're looking at. And it doesn't mean that the sort of affordability would come back in sort of one swoop. It may be sort of over two or two bond cycles, just like it's modeled now. And it doesn't mean that the steady state wouldn't change from year to year as it currently does. So every year as we're looking at revenues, borrowing costs, those types of things, we refine the, the steady state model. But what we are able to say is based on this plan of finance, that having this purchase would not have any direct impact on the state of state for steady state affordability that would not naturally be occurring because of the revenue or bar and rate changes. Um, so that's a, a really critical part there. And one of the, the really important parts of sort of doing this five year financing is it doesn't lock the city into a 20 year financing that then we have to find a way to unwind. This five year sort of financing allows for an authority to be sort of set up and do the acquisition and maintain maximum flexibility for the city and the authority. The, the second transaction we're looking at is an uptown property that is right next to a part of the, the Gateway Station. Um, and this really allows for the, the red line or the O line to really tie in directly to the Gateway Station itself. So it's a really critical part of making that happen. So this is a similar process where we're looking at a five year sort of short term financing because the authority would also be acquiring this because it's integral to the, the red line operational. Um, but one key difference here is that as a part of the overall CIP, we did actually have identified funding already for the Gateway Station, so we're able to use that. So again, it doesn't have any impact to other name projects or the CIP because we already had some funding there. So this is all sort of how we're able to sort of do this on sort of this, this period. Um, so I'll pause there or, or kick it over to Brad for. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, so as, as you've heard, um, over the past year, the city has been engaged in negotiations with Norfolk Southern. Um, those negotiations are for the acquisition of the O-Line corridor, uh, the rail corridor that's been owned by Norfolk Southern for many years. Um, the goal of that, uh, of the initial transaction here is corridor preservation. And the city is operating under corridor preservation, which is a FTA recognized authority. And this permits local governments or transit agencies to acquire right-of-way before the environmental process is complete. It's a tool that um, allows us to, from an, from an early acquisition standpoint, acquire a right-of-way that may be difficult to um, do so later on. Um, so as we're proceeding under corridor preservation, um, I think it's, it's noteworthy to point out that the city has done this before. Um, uh, actually, in 1997, the city acquired the uptown right away from North Carolina Railroad from 2nd to 12th Street. Um, we also did this in 2003 when the city acquired the R line from Norfolk Southern. In both of those examples where, uh, where the city acquired right away before we had uh, project funding in place. Um, you know, under corridor preservation, um, with that goal in mind here, we are also negotiating uh, for the O-Line an option, and that option would be for extending the acquisition into Mooresville, Iredell County. And um, so we could potentially exercise that option down the road and preserve that ability now. Um, in terms of city protections, I think it, you heard Ed speak a little bit about this already, but um, the sales tax legislation, the, the draft legislation does include a provision where when the new authority is established, it it will reimburse the city for the acquisition costs of the O-line. Um, and that is the plan to, you know, acquire this as part of that whole process. Um, in the event that the project would not advance, there is some language in the agreement, in, in the negotiated agreement now, where Norfolk Southern um, has requested the ability to counter um, any offer that the city would receive um, should the city uh, make the decision to um, entertain offers um, on the rail corridor in the future. So in terms of this um, ongoing negotiation, um, this is really our closing schedule um, that we're driving towards. And the real driver of this schedule is September 9th. And that is the, 
the closing deadline that's been mandated by Norfolk Southern. Um, and so our first um, date here is August 19th. We intend to go to closed session and present the material terms of the transaction to City Council. Um, on August 26th, once again, we would have a Council Action Review uh, checkpoint. And then we would aim for September 3rd Council consideration to actually approve the purchase and enter into the rail agreement with Norfolk Southern. And then obviously uh, September 9th is our, is our closing deadline. Uh, and so those, those dates are very important in order to make that September 9th closing. Thank you. So if you go to the next slide, we're now transitioned to topic two, which is the draft legislation. So Sarah and I will walk through uh, the key points of the legislation and the details of the draft. So I'll maybe start with Sarah. So at the core of this legislation is really the ability to allow the voters of Mecklenburg County to make a choice. And that choice is a one cent sales tax for transit and transportation. So that is the request of the General Assembly. One thing that I think is important to note in this draft legislation that you all um, had a chance to receive, I think on Friday and look at some summary documents as well, is that unlike the existing quarter cent that's available in the county, um, that was on the ballot several years ago. The draft legislation that you're looking at has specific language that specifies the use for roadways and public transportation so voters have a clear choice at the ballot box. So that's a, that's a critical thing to highlight um, in, in this document. Next slide. And then I'm just gonna touch on these three pieces and then Ed and I are gonna walk through a couple of them. Um, we talked a lot about the red line, but it probably bears repeating. Uh, within the draft legislation, it firmly establishes the red line as a priority rail project. Um, it firmly establishes that uh, there will be reimbursement for acquisition of the O-line and related property to protect the city's interests. Uh, and it also firmly codifies the engagement and the approvals that Davidson or Iredell County and Mooresville um, will have and will the approvals that they, they are um, necessitated to have for us to move forward. So it codifies those things. And then on the transportation revenue, um, it splits the one cent sales tax, 40% of the revenue being distributed directly to the local jurisdictions, the towns and the city for roadways. And roadways also includes bikeways and pedestrian infrastructure that are related. Uh, in the transit section, it's split into two pieces, uh, which, which uh, Chair Driggs talked a little bit about. But so the rail portion is limited to 40%, so there's a cap on the rail portion. On the, on the bus portion, which can be used for buses, for micro transit, for bus rapid transit, um, there's a 20% minimum, but any unused portion of that 40% can be pulled into the bus section. So um, that is a key piece of how the public transit allocation works. So one thing to note is, so if you take that 100%, so the one cent, um, what you're really looking at is more than doubling investment in public transit based on our current existing half cent sales tax today. Um, so I think that's really important to note. And then the third piece, which we're gonna come back to in more depth in the end, is that it establishes a new authority. And so this is a independent transit authority that um, combines the dual ro roles today that the city and the MTC um, currently share and instead streamlines them into one role with the opportunity for new jurisdictions to join in the future um, when they bring resources to the table. So we'll, I'll, I'll come back to that after Ed talks a little bit more uh, in depth about the revenue piece. So if we go to the next slide, um... Let's start with the big numbers, right? So let's, what does this mean as we talk about uh, the one cent and the breakdowns that Sarah just described? So over 30 years, uh, that's a $19.4 billion uh, amount of revenue. Year one, you can see in this chart, is, is represents $345 million. So the scale, just what is really important to understand the scale of the, the investment we're talking about. This is a 30-year horizon, uh, but a significant amount over a, over a long period of time, but also in a yearly, uh, uh, on a yearly basis. And I'll talk you know, specifically about what that means for us and the towns. A point here I also, we, I think it's important that we make, and this is based on a, 
uh, relatively recent Charlotte Regional uh, Alliance study, which is of that sales tax in the county, around 30% of that is coming from folks from outside of the county, non-Mecklenburg uh, County, City of Charlotte residents. That's the tourism that we're supporting, uh, the business uh, development, um, people that are commuting in and out of the county. So there's the, the point here to be made is that that shared, uh, that shared cost is part of this vision. And so it's not just our residents, it's not just the county, we're actually taking advantage of a lot of the investment we're already making in our, our, our long-term economic development plans. If we go to the next slide, so there's gonna be a lot to, for me to unpack on this one. So it'll just take me a few minutes to walk you through it, but I think it's important to sort of dive into, you know, what these breakdowns mean, how it relates to some other funding opportunities what it means for us and what it means for the towns. There's a couple of important shifts I wanna highlight here. The first one is this shift in thinking from uh, this strategy around uh, a cost-based approach versus a revenue-based approach. So what we're saying now is our plan, our vision is now we're thinking about it from a revenue standpoint. So as I just described, if we get this, uh, half, uh, this one cent sales tax, 30 years, that's 19 billion, that's our plan. So our job now is to fit our vision, our plan within that revenue. And so that's a new shift and it sort of starts to calibrate some of the decisions that we need to make and sort of the priorities that we establish. Those, you know, the projects that we define will have to be matched to that revenue, not the other way around. So again, a, a really important distinction. Second part of this, and this sort of came uh, certainly a bit from the Charlotte News work, but also all of the work that we do, city and towns, which is recognizing that this has to be multimodal. And so this revenue and the, the scale of this allows us to dive into the needs that we have across all modes, right? And, we, and the notion is we need to balance and, and uh, extend that, that funding across that, that broad spectrum across the board. Obviously that includes roads. And so the notion here is that road investment, uh, the 40% is directly uh, distributed to the city and the towns really to target to their own needs and priorities. And so the notion is it's, it's locally driven, it's city of Charlotte driven. Uh, we tie those to the priorities that you set and the needs that we have. If you look at and across not just our plans, but the plans of the other towns, those needs are diverse, right? And those needs are multimodal, depending upon whether you're in Davidson or you're in uh, Pineville or you're in uh, Mint Hill, the priorities that they have are unique, but they also touch across all the things that we know are important, pedestrian, safety, bike, and certainly road congestion. So again, I wanna just make the point that that investment is tailored to the vision of us in, our in the local towns of the county, and it really crosses a broad spectrum of investment from a mobility standpoint, not purely road congestion necessarily. The other part of this is, uh, in, a, in a new way of thinking of it from a transit standpoint, is this dedication to bus, right? And so we've made a unique uh, approach here about the idea of dedicating, in this case, the 20% of this revenue for bus. It's important because you know bus is the backbone of our system. It moves the majority of our transit riders. We have a vision about better bus. We have Sarah mentioned micro transit is on the horizon for us. Uh, bus priority and investment in those corridors. So it is an important shift now to say that our new vision and our our uh, uh, our commitment to moving our transit customers around bus this is a time for us to really make that commitment and, and sort of wire it into our investment strategy. This is, to put that 20% in scale, is around 40 or 50% uh, on more than what we're spending today on bus. So if you think about what our investment is today from our bus system, this represents over 30 years a 40 to 50% increase. So that's a significant amount. And it's again, a commitment to the visions that we're developing and the commitment we have around transit and moving folks in our city in an equitable, uh, affordable way. And then certainly the sort of the big topic here is this idea of a limitation on rail. And so absolutely, um, that's part of this strategy, but it's for a number of factors. One is certainly what I've just described, which is it's a multimodal approach. We recognize that we, the city, the towns, we all have road needs. And so that's part of this funding strategy, this dedication and commitment to bus. So those things come with then the need to sort of define what that rail investment will be. And that's sort of how we landed. 
Last thing that certainly maybe goes without saying, but we've also clearly have heard that to get support from the legislature that there needed to be a balanced approach. And so this is a take on that balanced approach, a multimodal approach, roads, bus, transit, uh, but in a context of sharing and balancing that, that investment across all the needs we have, um, across all the needs and, and priorities that we have. So that's, that gives you at the top there is that sort of um, bucketing of the 19 billion, the 40, 20, 40. Let me, let me talk a little bit about um, the bottom part of that. Let's talk about the transit piece because an important part that we haven't been talking about uh, a lot is the notion that the local funding, this local potential for transit uh, funding is an important part of leveraging federal dollars. So if you look at the bottom, now what we're talking about is with that 60%, <clears throat> essentially a doubling of, the, of what we have now, you're sort of taking the half cent and you're putting the, the 60% on pot the top of that, that's 1.1 cent. That now becomes a key part of leveraging significant federal dollars. In this case, our estimation is around 5.9 billion. So that, that then creates what is a, a $17.5 billion 30-year transit program, right, across everything we just described, leveraging the federal dollars that's a, you know, for every dollar we spend, that's another 50 cents that we get outside of our, our local funding. So significant opportunity. We're at the cusp of, you know, and being competitive nationally for those funds uh, to fund our vision. The, 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 the last thing I'll say about this, and it's clear um, in the conversations that we're having about this rail limitation, this is a program, right? And it goes back to the notion that this is a revenue-driven strategy so it's absolutely, it's clear that with this strategy, decisions, new decisions will be, have to be made about that transit program. Those decisions rest with the MTC, they rest with the future authority, they rest with a, a full community engagement around those, those decisions. Uh, but the notion is let's define the revenue that we have, let's define how we want to sort of bucket those um, pieces of investment, and then absolutely we'll have to make new decisions about the priorities and the funding of our transit program in different ways, given this sort of the first time we're making these decisions on a transit basis with a fiscal constraint, some, some boundaries around uh, how we would make decisions around priorities for transit. Last thing I'll say, it's not on this slide, um, but let's also put this in the context of our other regional plan, which is our, our um, Metropolitan Transportation Plan. It's, it's certainly it's a three-county plan, CRTPO, but it's the other part. It's the other piece of this puzzle. And so, on top of that, this sort of the next 30 years of that plan, you know, they have uh, the vision of that is 6.9 billion. Of that, you know, about 2.3 is is actually uh, identified for funding. But the scale of that uh, that is, I think, important to think about this piece these two big pieces of the puzzle, right? The local funding we have around this potential for the sales tax, coupling that with our bigger vision uh, for the MTP and our, our regional transportation investment, that touches federal funding, road and transit. It touches state funding for our roads. It touches our local commitment for funding on the sales tax. It certainly touches our local and your local commitment for funding with our capital investment program. So. There's a big picture here that's even more, even larger than the 19.4 billion, touches across all of our funding opportunities, commitments we make locally to the potential for uh, getting uh, shared uh, benefit and shared uh, leveraging of, of federal and state funding uh, long term. I think I've covered everything on that slide. Let me move to the next piece to sort of, I wanna give you a couple other snapshots just to give you a better sense or maybe a more clear sense of what this means for Charlotte. So now this just, just takes the 345 million. We're just gonna take for a moment a look at that first year of revenue. And we broke it down into the same bucket. So 60%, the purple on the bottom, 40% for roads on top. Um, Again, given you scale there, that 60% represents $207 million a year for transit. That doesn't include what I just described, which was the leveraging of other funds. That's just the local revenue. A way to think about that, and it's highlighted on this slide, is 90% uh, of our transit, more than 90% of our transit uh, riders and customers are and live in Charlotte. So think about it in that context, that that investment is directly impacting and benefiting 
the folks that live and work and move in Charlotte. So we're, we're, we're getting a significant amount of that investment. The, the allocation of the roads, again, let's talk a little bit about what that 40% means. And, and, I, and, and uh, Chairman Driggs just described this a little bit in the beginning about how we distributed this to the towns. So let me, let me just spend a moment on that. So what we've done is created a couple of ways to calculate that and kind of um, define how we would equi equi equitably distribute those dollars. So it's based on a proportional share of the local road miles of all the different towns. It also uses what's called the Powell Bill methodology, which is a sort of a combination of both local road miles and population. So there's a, a couple of ways, depending upon which benefits the most for the towns, you could use those two methodologies. Sort of very specific, it's driven by sort of state, already defined state methodology. So we sort of rested on a very specific way to calculate that. But then to my point about our benefit of transit and to Mr. Driggs' uh, point about the 125, uh, the notion was a recognition that certainly a significant amount of the transit investment is weighted a bit more to Charlotte. And so this discussion about an, an additional 25% essentially on the distribution for the towns was a recognition that there's a, there's, a, there's a benefit that we get a little bit larger, certainly a lot larger on the transit side than the towns do. And so that 25% reflects that discrepancy and gives them a, a little bit more essentially to invest in the, again, the multimodal needs, the visions that they have in their towns, a distribution uh, that's sort of reflective of that, that uh, difference between transit. Take a big picture back, though. It, that, that gets a lot into the weeds, <clears throat> but I think it's important to sort of take a step back. If you look at the, the 186 on that slide, the sort of the 90% of our transit, uh, the, the 102 on the 40% the of the roads that we get, that's 83% of that revenue for Charlotte. So that it's important to kind of keep that bigger picture in mind, which is, we're getting a significant amount and an important part of our vision, important part of the strategic mobility plan is the transit plan. It's really the foundation of the strategic mobility plans. So that's That makes our plan work. On top of that is our distribution of road money, which then weaves that thing, that plan together. Of the revenue that we're talking about, that's 83% of that revenue is for us to implement our vision for mobility. Uh, and certainly it's, it's a shared way then to have the towns do the same thing, but the, in their own way with their own needs and their own priorities. Last slide, the last piece I'll make and the last pitch I'll make to, as the manager described in the work that we've been doing with you around the strategic investment areas and this mobility blueprint that we've talked about. Put this into context of what the manager just described. You made, you made the decision in your recent budget to create this program uh, for strategic investment areas. The potential for the bond in the fall will be for 55 million over a two year period, a great initial investment in that vision. But again, take that 102, multiply it by two over the same bond period, and you've got you know, $200 million on top of and, and scaled to the initial investment that you made. That's a, that's a unprecedented scale. It's almost four times what you've already committed to in the capital program to implement everything we've been doing uh, for the last several years, building on the comp plan, building on our strategic mobility plan to really invest. So it's, it, just, it was important to us to give you that context. There's a lot of numbers here. There's a lot of different ways for us to share and cut and show you how this distribution works, but there's there are a couple things we really want to emphasize and put it into scale with some of the decisions you made around mobility uh, just recently. So I'll stop there. I think now we want to, I'll throw it back to Sarah to talk uh, and, and describe kind of where we are on the draft uh, legislation around the authority. So the next evolution with the significant funding that Ed was just describing is to adapt the governance structure to bring it into the future um, akin to what most large cities have, which is an independent transit agency governed through an independent authority. Um, but the point I want to make with this slide is just that it's not a new concept. Um, back in 2004, UNC Charlotte did a study uh, which recommended that an authority is really the governance structure of the future. 
um, you know, over the past several years with the conversations around Connect Beyond and Central Lina and how we really truly look at creating a structure that can be even more regional um, into the future. Uh, the com conversation about a transit authority has been front and center. Um, and beyond that, uh, through the work that management partners did to look at CATS several years ago, um, one of the key findings that they, that they discovered was that the current structure was um, was a bit confusing for, for staff and for the public and that a streamlined structure would be really important moving forward, especially with additional funding. So if you think about um, why we're talking about this now and paired with the conversation uh, around the additional funding that's embedded in this draft legislation, it really is that, you know, before 1998, um, CATS didn't exist. The city had a, had a department. It was a transportation department. The population was 600,000. Now we're talking about 1.2 million. We're talking about paratransit service, light rail, streetcar, bus, microtransit. Um, and, and this really is the, the moment to, um, to evolve the governance to meet the opportunity with the additional revenue that this draft legislation affords. I think this is just a good visual to reinforce that part. If you start to look at the current system compared to an authority, um, what you now see with an authority is an independent entity that is responsible for all activities. So it merges the financial responsibility, the policy responsibility, um, that again are dual roles today into one streamlined organization, uh, meeting the recommendations that I talked about previously. And I think one of the key pieces is that, uh, um, and I don't think we've talked about this very specifically yet on any of the slides, is that um, as part of the sales tax can be pledged as revenue bonds. And so um, the authority would back the debt, the city no longer would be backing the debt. And so it becomes truly independent in a way um, that is critical for uh, increasing the investment in transit into this next evolution. So then just to get into a couple more of the details of what this looks like in the legislation, it's a 27-member board with appointments that recognize the need to represent all jurisdictions. So 12 appointments for city council, three which represent business interests, 12 county appointments of which six are uh, from the towns, two state legislator appointments and one governor appointment. So again, what this recognizes I think is really three things. that The state should have a voice in our infrastructure that supports the region. It recognizes that all jurisdictions should have a voice within uh, the, all of the jurisdictions that are a part of this. And then it really focuses on a more equitable allocation um, to, to uh, Chairman Driggs' point earlier that allows for the city, which has 90% of the current riders, to be represented in a way that is reflective of who is using the system. Um, a couple other points to this that I think are important. Um, it then merges the, the half cent with the new uh, 0.2 and 0.4 um, so that it is again over doubling the investment in public transportation. It allows for regional expansion so that when a jurisdiction, a county that is uh, neighboring us is interested in joining and um, that there is an opportunity to do that with resources but it also protects the city back to sort of the protection piece um, and, and the existing members in Mecklenburg County in that a supermajority is needed to um, bring new folks in and to then clarify what the voting structure would look like at that time. Uh, the creation of the authority is defined in this legislation. Um, it's created by the county and then it specifies a series of events that need to occur including um, studies, reports to all the jurisdictions, um, to support a really responsible transfer of um, operational control as well as debt and assets to the new authority in a way that, um, again, both is um, mitigating the city's risk and being responsible, but also setting the authority up to be successful to serve the residents that um, are counting on this service. 
Uh, and then I think the final piece uh, that I'll just highlight is that a supermajority is still needed for any of the changes to the bylaws, um, in addition to bringing in new members of the authority. So that's an ex that's a uh, additional protection, and I just wanted to, to highlight that in addition to reinforce the point that CAT staff would transfer to the new authority and that there are protections around benefits carrying over um, that's codified into the draft language. So I think that covers it. There's a lot of information there. We just put up the slide here to show um, kind of what the schedule looks like. I don't know if we want to throw it back to the manager to wrap it up or go back to the chairman. Thank you all. <coughs> uh, I have to say I think the dedication and professionalism of the staff in this work has been extraordinary. I hope everybody appreciates the quality of what we just saw. And Ed is one numbers guy to another. That was good. Okay. Uh, I'd like to open up now for comments or questions from the committee, and I guess we'll start at the end. Sir. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this kind of reminds me of my first campaign when I had two speeches. <laughs> one if I lost, and one if I won, <laughs> and I lost. And no, one, <laughs> and no one cared what I thought after I lost. Um, it just demonstrates the complexity from my perspective of what we're dealing here with, for sure. Um, I served uh, 10 years in the North Carolina State Senate, uh, representing Huntersville, Davidson, and Cornelius, and University City. Um, I'm a current member of the Charlotte City Council um, times two. So I've been here for a while and understand the history uh, of public transportation um, commitments that were made. I chaired the Senate's Transportation Committee um, uh, when we were trying to ensure that we got the matching dollars from D.C. as well as in Raleigh. So I, I kind of get what we're trying to do here. And I'm a big picture guy. And, and I don't say that to, to um, talk about my resume or how long I've been here, but to, to demonstrate how I'm looking at this, right? with a, a different perspective and uh, a, a different lens for sure. Um, I want to thank all the regional partners who have participated and those who are on the line. Um, I respect their jurisdiction uh, and their ability to act on the best interests of their communities, whether it's Huntersville and Davidson and Canadians talking about the long-weighted red line or line for um, the expansion of their public transportation to Charlotte or Matthews and their commitment to um, a resolution that they submitted last night for uh, their position on this issue. Or uh, even Morrisville, which is not a part of this county that uh, has um, a interest in what we're doing. They all are fighting for the best situation for their particular jurisdiction. Uh, and I sit here today fighting for Charlotte's best interest for our jurisdiction and our long-term goals and objectives and our place uh, in the region historically today and where it should be tomorrow. Um, I, I still focus on the day-to-day -day operation of the system, which is going on as all this is happening around us. Uh, the employees of the system who are really not employees of the city of Charlotte that works for uh, another agency, right? Uh, the ridership that 90% of those riders are based here in the city of Charlotte and, um, and how we manage all that. And so uh, I'm here talking about Charlotte and, and from a big picture perspective in terms of our place in the region. And I, I want to thank Chairman Driggs for indulging me for the last couple of weeks uh, in our conversations. Obviously the mayor uh, for her leadership um, going back to 2019 when I got back about how do we uh, tackle regional transportation. Um, Brent and Katz, the Mayor Pro Tem, all who have engaged me in, in conversations over the last several 
weeks and months in reference to uh, this topic. And so I'm going to try to be as succinct as I can be, Mr. Chairman, um, um, without being redundant, um, and to kind of share my perspective from where we are today. Um, I responded to an email that the manager sent to council. I think he sent it on July 17th. I responded on the, the 23rd. Um, and um, I thanked him for his leadership. Um, I thank him for representing the city of Charlotte with distinction with his peers across the region um, and congratulated him on the progress that we were making uh, moving forward. But I also pointed out some concerns. Um, um, and um, first and foremost, that such a transformational project, which really is going to change how we deliver public transportation, that impacts housing patterns, uh, job placement throughout the region, um, that critical deal points were being presented to the city council, and from my perspective, uh, without any formal discussion. Now, certainly we talked about uh, Norfolk Southern and the red line, and that, that's a major coup. I am fully supportive of the city of Charlotte um, purchasing the red line. Details have to be worked out. Uh, safeguards are in place. I think it unlocks uh, the um, transportation ridership and strategy for the northern part of the county, and it fulfills an obligation going back when I was a state senator that gave a lot of people over there a whole lot of frustration, right? Uh, and that frustration has been relieved because Norfolk Southern has found the work and good gesture with us to kind of make something happen, right? Uh, when that didn't happen, everyone blamed Charlotte, but we couldn't do anything because we didn't have to train track. Uh, and so I, I, um, I, I think that's a, a huge accomplishment, uh, not only for the city of Charlotte, for the region, and it should be pointed out that we are paying for it all. I don't think Mecklenburg County is contributing or Davidson or Pineville or Matthews or Men Hill. I think we've, we're, we're going to bite this bullet. I think we should um, for the region uh, and demonstrate regional um, support uh, and a commitment to building a better region with Charlotte at the center of it, right? I, I think that makes a whole lot of sense. We did talk about the one cent sales tax. That's been going around for years. So that is no surprise to me or anybody else. Uh, and the ability to attract federal dollars that match that, right? Which is huge, huge deal. Uh, and in a political environment that we don't know what's going to happen in November, whether or not those funds are going to be there, we hope no matter who wins that, that people view public transportation, how people get back and forth to work, our roadways, our highways, that that transcends partisan politics, right? That is just for our, good for our country, our nation, uh, and certainly for our region. So I'll say that. But we didn't talk about an authority much, right? And, you know, I don't want to get off about this authority thing, but there are certain, certain hurdles that we have to clear even before we get there, right? The hurdle of um, getting the General Assembly to, to accept it and then vote for it, and then the hurdle of coming back home to get Mecklenburg County to put it on the, the ballot, uh, and then the last hurdle of getting the voters to approve it. So there's a lot of work to be done before we get into the logistics and the details of, of an authority, right? I support an authority. That's our future. I also support consolidation. I supported it in 1995 around this table when we said no. Was, I thought it was a good idea then, and I don't think it's a good idea today. But this is short of that creating a regional authority where we're all working together, talking to each other versus at each other, building our future together is in the best interest of the region. I just 
think there's a I think that's there's some process steps that um, that maybe we went too far in terms of defining it and outlining it and for my taste. Um, I voted no for the interlocal agreement. I think I was the only council member that did and had less to do with um, what was in the agreement. It had more to do with process. Uh, I had process concerns then in June. Uh, I have process concerns now um, that we are not bringing the council along with us uh, and therefore the community at the same times. Um, we we got to create an environment where if we're going to do this together that we don't create winners and losers. The folks in northern towns are happy. Uh, they, they get the red line. Uh, they get possibly road money as well. Uh, and our colleagues in Matthews feel that they're being left behind. Uh, I do have a vision for East Charlotte, um, which included transit, not buses. Um, as we begin to invest in Eastland Yards, the money that we're spending at Bojangles Arena, other investments that we are making and should be making uh, on East Charlotte and the economic impact that transit can have on that side of the city. So that's a consideration. Um, and I did take the time to uh, not only listen to the town of Matthews meeting last night, uh, I got a hard copy of the resolutions uh, and I, um, I respect their right uh, to, to voice dissent um, for their jurisdiction. Um, but here we are, right? <laughs> and uh, and um, um, how we move forward, and, and the presentation was great. It's a hell of a lot of information. <laughs> it's it's a, a, a lot of information. If, we are going to make thoughtful decisions that is generational change. Um, and I commend the manager for, you know, filling in the details and staff uh, as they should. Um, but it's a lot of details, a lot of moving parts, a short time frame, uh, and um, and a lot of questions. So let, me, so let me ask some questions and then I'll, I'll get off the mic and allow my colleagues to ask it. So the goal line, is the goal line guaranteed as a part of this one cent sales tax efforts pass, i.e. the extension for East Charlotte and West Charlotte? Right now it's one of those things where it's, it's not a part of the, their priority. So would it be a priority item uh, so, Councilmember Graham, if I understand your question about the goal line, the decisions to be made about which projects and the priority of those projects are not a city council decision. It's an MTC decision or the new authority decision. But, but we made a decision before to, to move forward with it independent of the MTC. So, if this is approved, well, I mean, is there a, a question mark there about where the funding will come from? I'm just curious. I, I'm not sure I understand the it's question. It's an unfunded project now, right? We pay $4.8 million for preliminary engineering design. I don't think the city has any money for, for actually implementing the goal. I'm, I'm just curious. Oh, I'm sorry. I now, I'm sorry. Okay. I th thought you were talking about moving the goal line, the goal post. Okay, so the goal line phase three is currently in a refresh, just like the red line is in a refresh. Um, what you're speaking to is years ago, it wasn't funded by that half cent sales tax, so the city decided to move forward with phase one and phase two. Everything that's been contemplated up to this point would be the 2030 plan, which includes the red line, silver line, east-west, um, blue line extension into uh, Pineville, 
as well as the go line, phase three, east and west, should be considered. But once again, that's a decision for the MTC or the future authority. All right. So that's a question mark there, right? That's, there's no certainty there. I would, I would add to that is that even the conversations about the Silver Line East, whatever mode of transportation it is, is a decision for the MTC or the future authority. Okay. The, the one sense, and I know for years that we've made commitments to the General Assembly, uh, to the, all the towns that we would go after one cents. Uh, Matthews last night suggested that they may be willing to do more and that that decision was voted down. So can you help me understand how, how that conversation went and, and, and whether or not there's an appetite, obviously we've, we're, way down the road uh, in reference to the talking with the General Assembly. One sense is what they've heard, was what we asked for, and now this new, not even an opportunity, suggestion that there could be more. Is there an appetite for more? So Councilman Graham, I would say, now that it's in front of all of the elected bodies, if that's the will of the elected bodies to go forward to try to get more than one cent, then I think that's the perfect place to have this, this that discussion. The the authority, and I think twenty seven people doing anything is too much. But that's a whole another thing, right? Um, the authority itself, I'm on record saying that that's where we're headed. Will there? Could there be? Can we redraft the legislation? And let me, ask, let me ask this first question first, then I'll ask the second one. Was there, you got five bodies looking at this document, right? Were they, are we expected to pass it as submitted, or, or is there room for revisions? I would say, Councilmember Graham, that it's an independent decision for each jurisdiction, just like Matthew's last night. So if there's something that's substantially different that this body wants to do, that's well within the authority of the body. So if the council wanted to say, hey, we are, we are totally on board and purchasing the red line, moving forward with Norfolk Southern, it makes sense, right? We want to do that, my hands up in the ear for that that we, we want to go to the General Assembly, a place I've been for 10 years, so I kind of think I know it pretty well. Uh, some of the same folks are still there. I think I know them pretty well, too. If we wanted to, to send something a lot more, less complicated up there, which focused squarely on the acts, which is the want sense, and, and refer to the authority that this is where we want to go and that we want to establish a, um, a uh, transportation summit for the region so that folks are hearing public conversations about decisions that we're making and the give and take of the negotiation with all the parties in the region uh, versus um, getting a document that's already been pre-baked that many folks don't even know who the bakers were or some of the ingredients in it. Could we send something a, a lot simpler up there other than talking about the, the authority and the makeup and the appointments and blah, 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 because I can see people getting hung up on that and not the main thing, which is the main thing, is getting the authority from the state to actually put it on the ballot uh, and have the community, um, I guess you can say the community has spoken, but the elected community. So to your uh, question, Mr. Graham, um, some of the 
input that we received from the business community that have had the conversations with members of the General Assembly is to have something that the vast majority of the uh, jurisdictions can agree upon. So I can't tell you how the General Assembly would act if there were eight different resolutions. I think they may act differently if there were six or seven or eight resolutions that were similar. But I, I can't tell you how they would react. But the concept was this is a starting point. The bodies get to decide what the bodies get to decide. Well, I want to go on record as fully supporting the purchasing of the, of the red line, the tracks. I know there's a lot more information to come. Um, um, and, 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 and then I'm, the, the legislation, I'm still struggling. And I talked to the chairman today, talked to the mayor pro tem today, conversation with the mayor, uh, Ms. Johnson and others, and I spoke. I'm, I'm struggling. Um, I'm struggling. I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Ms. Molina, I'll just go right down the line, if that's all right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, man, how do you come behind that? Um, that? That was, first of all, I'll start with thank you to the manager, to our staff for the very comprehensive details that you've delivered. That's a lot of information. Uh, it's information that we understand because we're involved in the process, but now it's to attempt to try to disseminate that to the people that we represent. That's going to be a little bit more detailed and, and um, trying to make it make sense for the interest of what someone may or may not be concerned about. So um, there are a few things that come to mind for me as I think through what this means. Um, I'm a multi-generational North Carolinian, um, and I've lived in Charlotte for half of my life. So I've seen our city blossom um, into... Uh, something that I'm actually proud of at home and away. When I get the opportunity to go and represent us, I feel proud because people see things outside of us that we don't see inside of ourselves. It's almost like trying to motivate someone and, and have them see the, the beauty that is them. You know, I tell somebody I'm from Charlotte and they're excited and they got questions and they want to know about our initiatives and, and things of that matter. Um, but what comes to mind for me initially is, is the fact that something you said, Sarah, you said in 1998 cats didn't exist, right? Like cats as we know it didn't exist. We had a transportation department, um, and, and that was it, right? So now we have cats as we know it. And um, I actually did the liberty of digging through who was representing us, and I, I looked at, like, the diversity of thought of the people who've made decisions since 1998, right? So I found that in, you know, the 1998 council, we had a fully split council. It was actually majority Republican and minority Democrat. You know, it's actually evolved tremendously over, you know, the time frame from the inception of what we began with what was a half cent sales tax until now. So, and, and considering that, and this is not a pitch to run for longer than two years, so don't take it that way. This is the fact that we've had a diversity of thought every single two years that implements its will on what this would become intermittently over the last 15 councils. There have been 15 councils intermittently to make decisions with regards to what transportation would be comprehensively from a Charlotte perspective. So, you know, kind of boxing that up and saying, you know, at one point in 1998, at the inception of this, we didn't even have a transportation system called CATS as we know it. Um, and then we implemented a half-cent sales tax with a majority Republican council. Um, and, and it's a few people, like my colleague was saying, who was around then. I will not tell you where I was. I will just tell you that I wasn't around. Um, but who've seen the diversity of that thought, right, and been around with the diversity of that thought. What would Pat McCrory say? about what we're doing today. You know, what would 
you know, Mayor Anthony Fox say about what we're doing today? Would he be on board? Would this have been something that he would actually say and, and support? So, I mean, it's a lot of things that I've circulated through my mind as I've began to kind of hold this in my hands as now a second term council member, again, with half of my life in the city, with service under my belt, respective to the amount of time that I've been on earth, um, and, and what I would do now as, as a result of what that means for me. Um, so just putting that into perspective and then saying that, you know, last night I also paid attention to what our neighbors in Matthews um, had to say, and the mayor of Matthews with 31,000 residents feels very strongly about what he would like to have happen because there, there's a perception of winners and losers. Um, and actually, my colleague asked one of the questions that I was going to ask because the 125,000 plus East Charlotte residents, the ones that continue to reach out to me, they want to know about the silver line, right? And so, you know, I, I wrote it down, you know, what has changed as far as the silver line is concerned? And my colleague answered, or he asked that question for it to be answered, but I think there's, there's something also, before I ask any questions to staff, I think it's something that I want to propose to the people that I represent in East Charlotte, right? I think about what the blue line is right now. Blue line, and when I, when I hear what the people that I represent are saying to me, they're saying, if you don't give us light rail, we don't get that economic impact that comes as a result of light rail, right? And if you take that away from us, how do we then get the econ economic impact that other places are going to see as a result of them getting light rail, right? And that, that's always the question that's going to be front and center. That's always going to be the thing that people are grappling with when you think of what's coming east and what's not. Can you do that with bus rapid transit? That's a big question. Um, but, you know, I think we have to ask ourselves in East Charlotte, what is the right type of development for us? What does it mean for us in East Charlotte? Do, do we want implementation, and, and this is an open-ended question, do we want uh, an impact that's similar to South End, right? Do, do we want that? Or, and if we do, that's okay, right? And if we don't, what is, what is the right impact that we're looking for that's going to give us the economic emphasis that we need as East Charlotteans and respectively Matthews and Mitt Hill because they're next door to us? Um, I think that's a big question that I think as this continues to develop, I'll be collecting that information from the residents to see, you know, how and when we could actually implement that and, and what that looks like. So um, I, I think I'll ask the staff, right? So a decision from uh, light rail, which, like I said, came from, you know, years ago, and now we're at bus rapid transit is – and again, I think the manager has already answered that question. This is not permanent, is what you're saying, right? So to say that bus rapid transit is the idea for East Charlotte, is that that's not set in stone, is what you said? Yeah, and I think maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Brent also. I, the, the key is the decision about the prioritization of rail projects, the 2030 plan does not reside with the city of Charlotte. It resides with the MTC or that future authority. But Brent, if I've misstepped, you help me out. No, I, what you said is, is uh, absolutely correct, um, Mr. Manager. I, I would also say that while I understand and respect all of the conversation that's been going on in the public, um, in, in the towns about the silver line um, can totally understand why that conversation is going on um, but I think that what isn't being heard is important it's about the process um, so the transit plan is a plan that is approved um, after having um, stakeholder and community input that plan gets approved by the MTC and the transit plan or the 2030 plan as we call it has not changed um, today. It hasn't changed. It didn't change last week. What has changed is an acknowledgement that the funding that we potentially could receive from the state is less than we had once anticipated. 
So, so if that occurs, if the funding um, is less than anticipated, there will be a process, and that process will be to update the transit plan, to evaluate all elements of the transit plan, the red line being already set as commuter rail, but to develop a new transit plan that takes into account the financial realities of the funding that's available. And that will be a process that engages the community, engages the MTC, engages the stakeholders, and we will go through that process to update and develop what we call a fiscally constrained transit plan. Um, that includes the silver line, but all of the other elements that serve the five corridors of, of that we have identified throughout the region. So um, with that being said, and, and thank you for that answer, so why bus rapid transit in, instead of silver line? Like why? Why that in East Charlotte? So, so the determination of bus rapid transit in East Charlotte or in, on the west side or, or others has not been made. As the process to update the transit plan moves forward, it may be made. But I will say when we think about bus ra rapid transit, there's a lot that we talk about when we talk about bus rapid transit. And bus rapid transit is one of those things that can – range over a spectrum of implementations, right? It can look a lot like bus service with bus lanes and, and other improvements. It can also look um, not at all like standard bus service with its own dedicated right-of-ways and specialized vehicles. What I will say is if, if you've experienced bus rapid transit in North America, you have not experienced some of the higher level implementations of BRT. Those exist internationally, right? And so as we talk about the transit plan and we talk about the modes, right, BRT, rail, uh, microtransit, all of those different modes, we will try to meet the needs. Moving people forward is our, you know, is, is, is what CATS does. So we will look to meet the transit needs of the region in the best way that we can in a, in a financially, in a, in a way that meets the financial realities that we have, the funding that we have. And all of that will go into the decision making process that the MTC will have as they update the transit plan. Ultimately, that updated transit plan would then be recommended, as uh, Mr. McKinney stated, to be part of the MTP or the Metro Metropolitan Transportation Plan that. Uh, is the is the purview of the CRTPO? So and and so what I hear you saying is that, you know, um, I guess transit oriented development, something around the orientation of development, is what's going to influence the decision. But how can we be sure of that? Like we're going to really give this inform. We we and this is what people are going to ask me, right? When when this is over, people are going to ask me, how can we be sure of that? What's in it for us? Like, how can we make sure, especially for cats, for an example, right? So right now we're going to take something that is housed under the city of Charlotte that now we have the ability to make determinations for, and we're going to hand that over intermittently over a five-year period to an authority. Is that right or is that wrong? I see you shaking your head. Is that wrong? I just wanted to say it's the MTC. It's not the city of Charlotte. Yeah. Currently, the MTC does have authority over setting the transit plan. That is something that is inherent in the interlocal agreement, has been since the beginning, um, as part of their responsibilities for setting policy around transit. The, the other thing I will say, it, clearly, um, from a CATS perspective, we um, – Transit-oriented development and, and what transit can create as far as that development is, is important, um, is, is, is very, very good. But our primary focus is to move people, to provide transit to the community. And I will say whether it's light rail, um, all of the modes are important to create mobility across the region. There is not one that is better or worse when it comes to the entire mobility picture. They are all part of that and, and are important as we think about our primary mission, which is moving people, is getting people throughout the community, giving, giving them mobility options throughout the community. Okay. 
So, I mean, I, like I said, I, I, I know that this is still, from what you're saying, very malleable. I got maybe one or two questions, Mr. Chairman, if you'll allow me. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the manager. Yes. So I, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to make sure that something that doesn't get lost in translation. So, um, I think Ed said it earlier. At some point, there needs to be a fiscally constrained plan, and that basically means you have so much money and you make the projects fit the money. Up until recently, it hasn't been that. It has been a vision, and it's just a bunch of projects. So the moment that the directive or the information we received to move this thing forward, because it had been in neutral for years, because 90% was dedicated to rail and 10% was roads, or 80% was rail and 20% and was roads, um, and the signal we received from Raleigh is no way. In that 80-20 split, it was more reasonable that all of these projects could be funded like they are in the plan. What I will say to you is just, it's just math. If, and I, I'm just going to say it, if the Silver Line <laughs> East is, rep represents about half of the cost of the, all the rail projects, and you've changed the, the funding mechanism from 80% to 40, something is going to give. But what I'm saying is it, it's not staff's determination of that. We would have been disingenuous to say, oh, at 40% you can pay for it all. You can't. But that decision is going to be made at, at some point by the MTC or the authority. But all we were trying to do is say, if the directives where you must do the red line and you have to substantially significantly change the rail portion this plan cannot be funded as it is today whether you do value engineering or you do some things fall off that's all we were trying to, to say to you is you can't have it both if, if that's fair I, and I think I understand that well, Mr. Manager. I think the question becomes, and actually you bring up a good point because I even wrote that down, um, who was a part of making those decisions? Because what, what someone who is living in East Charlotte or Matthews, they're going to say is someone chose winners and losers, right? Someone said that East Charlotte couldn't be included. Who was involved in, I guess, the creation of what we're looking at right now? Who were the state? Sorry to interrupt, but I've been advised by Ms. Johnson that she has to leave in a few minutes, and I would love to give her the opportunity to speak for a couple of minutes before she goes. Do you mind if we come back to you? She has oh, to go. sure. Thank you. Thanks. Go ahead. Thank you. I really would love to hear from the representative, and, I'm, and I apologize, council member, but this, is, this has kind of been the process. So this was on our agenda from 4 to 5.30, which left council 30 minutes to discuss this very, very, very important subject. We've been talking about the Silver Line and an authority for 30 years. And council has 30 minutes on the agenda to discuss it. And then 30 days to vote for it. My challenge with this is transparency. My, Councilmember Molina was asking the questions, who made those decisions? We can't answer those questions. And we've had small group meetings, but the elected officials have not been involved in these discussions, and that's important. And I had the honor and the pleasure to watch the Matthews meeting last night, and I don't, not only do I respect Mayor Higdon and the Board of Commissioners, I applaud them. I applaud them for standing up for their constituents, um, and, and standing up for to do what they've promised for a long time. I do have some questions. Um, are there any pathways that would accommodate the entire region? If you're uh, suggesting the 2030 plan, the rail, more revenue. Okay. So like council member Graham said, Perhaps we should discuss the 1.4 cent sales tax in order to uh, accommodate the uh, 
the region. I support the sales tax increase. I, I championed the infrastructure discussion. I know we need funding for that. But, you know, we don't, I don't want to be a part of a council that selects winners or losers or makes a sh what feels like a short-sighted decision. The, these are the, this is the logic that unintended consequences are made of. Um, how much, and these are, some of these questions are from, from the meeting last night. How much has been spent on the Silver Line plan thus far? Approximately, so I will need to get you an exact number, but I believe the original contract was for approximately $50 million. The design contract or the, the planning work. And I asked this question earlier, do we know how much acreage has been developed in our city along the TOD? We monitor that and we can provide you a report on the, um, we, we monitor TOD along the Blue Line, Blue Line Extension, and Gold Line, and we can uh, provide you a, a report of development both in dollars or and, and or acreage within a half mile of each station. That's how we define TOD, transit-oriented development. And that would be great because the reason I ask is because if we put ourselves in Matthew's shoes, they've done that same type of planning for their, along their TOD. And they've planned for the Silver Line. Even the, the plans for the, the east side included this type of um, transportation or this type of improvement. So I, like Council Member Graham, I, I want to see this. Even the uh, authority, I understand we need to move fast, but it's the process and the, the lack of transparency for me that I'm challenged with. There's not been any public uh, discussion. And I think that they really need to be engaged. And, I, and I've asked you, Mr. Jones, you know, why now? What's the rush? So I, um, that's where my concerns are. Um, and, and I'd like to see a solution that includes a collaborative approach. If we're collaborating, I, I just don't understand the concept of when we get to a certain point to, to change plans and someone on that team just, just got to drop off. And, and, and we don't stop to try to en encompass or include uh, everyone. I think the city is, is growing so quickly that there's not a lot of affordability in our city. We need to capitalize on, on regionalization and do what we can to protect that. Uh, we'll, we'll look back. This is a multi-generational decision. It's, it's an honor to be a part of. And I think we need to really move slowly deliberately and be intentional about equity and, and inclusivity, which includes the entire region. So um, I don't, I'd like to ask what the process is for today because I do have to leave. It was on the agenda until 530. So what is the process for today? So I think what we're going to do is uh, hear the remainder of what uh, Council Member Molina has to say. I have a couple of remarks, and frankly, I think at that point, uh, I didn't realize that we had indicated a 5.30 end, but I, I think uh, based on that, we need to look forward to August 26th, when this is scheduled for a full council discussion. We've heard a lot today to think about, and I think we'll need to come prepared to respond to what you've said, what Mr. Graham said, Ms. Molina. Um, <clears throat> and uh, key thing was for members of this committee to get this information in this detail at this point in time. Our goal is to try to have the committee vote on this and make a recommendation to the full council, but not today. Okay. All right? Thank you. All right? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we need to try to wrap up. You I'll, I will. I'll try. I'll right. try. Okay, so I, I got one that's actually kind of pressing. So I know that Austin, they allocated a portion of their funds uh, for anti-displacement for their rail plan. Um, are we able to do that? I think it was like a, they, they allocated a portion of their funds to, you know, kind of mitigate anti-displacement when they did, you know, their rail plan. Is that something that we can consider? Is that malleable? Yeah. <clears throat> so it, it's been a while, but Austin had a, um, I think, uh, maybe an eighth of a cent of uh, property tax and, and a bunch of different pots that they had to... Um, try to implement their plan. 
<clears throat> as we started to look at this, part of the anti-displacement work has been going on. So just think about it, there's a $100 million bond for housing that will be on the ballot in November, as well as the work from the Nest Committee and the Equitable uh, Development Committee. So there have been a number of funds that have been pushed in that category, not connected to the sales tax, but still funding sources. Okay. Um, can, I, and also, can, I, can I ask yeah, Mr. Sure. Jones, I thought that there was also the opportunity for federal funds to um, build and along with um, housing and other initiatives as well as yes. what Austin did. So if we are doing, if we do this, then we would also present to the federal government, could you help us develop appropriately housing especially? Yes, ma'am. Um, so Madam Mayor, you said something very important because my next part of something that I was looking into um, within, I know the this is a big initiative and the Black Political Caucus has said this over and over. If you remember when we were talking Blue Line, there were people tearing up this conversation about affordability along the red line. When you're talking about urban planning, these two things are inextricable, right? Affordable living along transportation. East Charlotte in particular, we have some of the highest bus ridership in the city of Charlotte, right? So you talk about building out a plan that is an inextricable conversation with housing. And I know this may not be the format, but I just want to put this out here since it is the open forum for it. You know, are we going to consider, and I think, Madam Mayor, you just alluded to that, right? There's some additional opportunities for housing. Is there not yes. to have that conversation? Yes. Um, at least, do, do we set a percentage? Is that something that needs to be in the legislation? How do we do that? Well, we that's have, a little different. Have, my recall is that we'd have to go through the federal agency just like we would ask for the money to match the transportation part of it. We'd ask for money to actually build housing along with it. So that's, a, that's actually a great, that's a, that's a glowing point for me, right, to say that, you know, there's a federal opportunity for affordability, housing, things that could actually tie into this. I think that's a, a, a separate conversation, Mr. Chair. But I think it's a point to bring up because looking at some of our, um, you know, the, the cities that we would compare ourselves to, I think this is an opportunity to inject those opportunities in this plan. Last thing, I promise, Mr. Chair, last thing. What about MBE, MWSBE participation? Are we going to have that conversation before, after, during? So I, I would say <clears throat> looking at the 40% that's coming to the city of Charlotte, that's 100% in your purview. So 40% of this one cent, as um, Ed said earlier, the $102 million in the first year, it's the same concept of what we're doing with our CIP. So there's an infusion of resources for any kind of projects that are transportation related. Okay, that's also a high point. Um, all right, Mr. Chair, I'm done for now. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I'd like to recognize the mayor pro tem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will be brief. First and foremost, I just wanted to say thank you to staff um, for having this incredible presentation. There's so much information in, in this deck that is on point, succinct, impactful. Um, and I've had the pleasure of being a member of the small working group working on this for months and months and months. Um, and so it's great to see it come to fruition here at a point where we can discuss it with the committee and, and more largely with council. Um, I am a native Charlottean. When I was in the first grade, I rode the quote unquote cat's bus to school by myself. Um, and so I've seen our transportation system come a very long way and so excited to have to be a part of the shaping of the future of it. And it really and truly is an opportunity, a generational opportunity to impact our investment in our community, not purely directly from a transportation perspective, which is what we're discussing, but as we've also been discussing, all the ancillary aspects that come along with that like housing, like economic development, um, good paying jobs close to where you live, et cetera. So I look forward to the broader conversation. I did want to make just one point, and 
I can acknowledge how much heavy lifting it's been and that's gone into this to get to this day and this point that the staff has done, that the working group, that this committee has done. But, you know, we've had other partners sitting along, around the table all this time. And I, we've, we've spoken a lot about Matthews, and I completely respect Matthews' jurisdiction just as equally as I respect the rest of the jurisdictions that have been at the table doing the heavy lifting that have indicated that this is a positive thing that they would like to support that would posi positively impact their communities and their residents. So over the next week, there'll be a lot of activities and comments around that. But I just wanted to specifically highlight, as we've done on slide 20, um, you know, the towns of Cornelius and Davidson and Huntersville and Mint Hill and Pineville along with Matthews, but those other towns have have circled the wagons and done the heavy lifting with us over several months. And they they believe that we have something here that can be generationally impactful from a regional perspective. And so I think it's important for us to acknowledge all of that work that has been done over the various jurisdictions in, in tandem, right, uh, through collaboration. And so I look forward to the next steps. Very excited about how this will impact the Queen City and our residents and the residents who live outside the Queen City who choose to work and, and come and play in Charlotte. So with that, I'll pass it back over to you, Chair. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Um, getting close to time to wrap up, I, I made my position, I think, pretty clear at the beginning. Uh, Mr. Graham, you and I will continue to debate. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate the fact that I think we are substantially in agreement. Uh, you have raised some points about how we're trying to do this uh, that I think will need to be considered. Uh, I'm kind of a big picture guy too. And one of the things that means to me is the towns do look after their interests, but we need to be clear. There is no interest of Charlotte's that's not also an interest of the towns and vice versa. We have to make common cause here. We have to recognize all the people that travel back and forth between Charlotte and the towns, the, the integrated nature of this economy and the interest that everybody has, just as we all do in public safety, uh, in trying to achieve this vision. Um, the process question, there are probably 50 or 60 elected officials like us collectively in among the membership, uh, and it would just be unwieldy, especially having heard that 27 members of the, this board would be a big number, how exactly is that supposed to work? So what we did is we had our managers, the professionals, work up something to bring to us. And it, we now have the absolute authority to accept or reject, but it really was not going to be easy to bring along everybody. And I want to be clear, I wasn't a party of these conversations either, okay? So there was no question of some council members <coughs> I was told things as part of the working group and the chair of the committee, but these conversations took place among a group of people who were sort of wieldy in number. And I guess the, the other thing is I've had many conversations with Mayor Higdon. I completely understand their frustration. Um, I still question in my own mind whether the best interests of Matthews are served by not being involved in this. This is worse than what they thought they were going to get. But I believe, yeah, my opinion is still worth pursuing. And I would mention too this, this winners versus losers narrative. The northern towns are not winners. They were supposed to get the red line 26 years ago, okay? So what, what's the big, uh, the big winner thing there? That is why the red line is in the position it is. It's not because we like them better than Matthews. So we're gonna have to overcome some difficult things. Uh, I just hope people will remember uh, in spite of all of the information that we've received, the bones of this thing that we're talking about are actually pretty simple. Get the legislature to let us create a revenue source and go down this path towards the authority. Uh, and many of the things that are being raised here can still be discussed uh, after we make that step. But if we don't make that step, we're just nowhere, right? So. Uh, um, I'm listening attentively. I look forward to the 26th when we will have a conversation in the full council 
uh, to uh, reflect on the issues you've heard about and try to move forward to another step. And, but uh, for now, barring any further input, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Ready to go? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you will stay. I think no. that. So, as I say, all in favor, please get up and leave. <laughs>